All right, in this lecture, we are gonna pick up where we left off last time. We're talking about metapopulations. We are still in the metapopulations lecture, all right? And we're just like halfway down. We had just talked about dynamic stability in metapopulations. We talked about spreading the risk where the larger the number of patches, the lower the chance that you will have regional or global extinction of the whole metapopulation. And now we're moving on to sources and sinks. And this is a really useful, practical concept that relates to conservation of real world systems. And it relates to one of the assumptions that we made when we were talking about classical metapopulations. One of the assumptions was that all patches are interchangeable. That is, every patch is similar to every other patch. They basically have the same quality. Their habitat is essentially the same. The size is basically the same. There is no difference, really, from one to the other. That is not super realistic in real world systems we do not see interchangeability of patches in fact we see differences we see differences in size we see differences in shape we see differences in the quality of habitat that each patch contains some patches might be able to support a large growing population and other patches might be able to support a really small growing population and other patches might be able to support a really small population but not growing. Perhaps individuals uh, are not super healthy on that patch. They don't have that many resources and the death rate outweighs the birth rate for whatever reason. Perhaps there's more predators in that patch. Patches differ in so many characteristics and it's important to take that into account in our models. When we do that, what we get is oftentimes what's called source and sink dynamics. So in the real world, patches vary in size and quality. And this figure just sort of illustrates the point. Um, we have a source population in the middle. It's a nice big population. This is a very good quality habitat. And it's surrounded by a bunch of patches that are habitat. They represent habitat because individuals can go there, they can live there, they can reproduce there, but they don't do very well and deaths ultimately outweigh the births within those patches and that's why they're called sink habitats. We'll get into the exact definition in a second, but here's a sink habitat, a sink habitat, sink, sink. So this source population is surrounded by sinks and uh, we'll talk about what can happen in that and we'll have a chance to go through an actual model that uh, can may hopefully bring some of these points home. We have one more source population in this landscape. Again, that's surrounded by sinks and there's some dispersal between these two sources. So here's a meta population, but it violates the assumption of interchangeability. These two are sources, all the rest are sinks. In some ways, we can think of the variation in vital rates across different habitats, just like we think about age structured populations, for instance. What we have now is a spatially structured population. So vital rates might be low here. In fact, the, the death rate in a sink outweighs the birth rate by definition. And so we have a low birth rate or a high death rate or both in these sink populations. In the source populations, the births outweigh the deaths by definition. And so uh, the vital rates the births and the deaths vary spatially in this landscape. And that is somewhat realistic. We can think of it as another dimension we want to in include when we think about our vital rates, not just age, vital rates changing by age. Juveniles have different vital rates than adults. In fact, vital rates can vary by space. So individuals living in one in population A can differ in their vital rates from individuals living in, pop, in uh, population B. In some patches, maybe so resource poor or have so many predators or for whatever reason, the population growth is negative. Those patches um, and other patches may have 
you know, perfect conditions for population growth. And that brings us to the definition of source and sink. A source population has a net positive growth rate, lambda above one, all right? And it provides a net, it is a net donor of immigrants to nearby patches that have lower quality habitat. And those nearby patches may be sources as well, but just have lower quality, or they may be a sink population. So what is a sink population? A sink population has a negative growth rate, all right? So lambda is less than one. Therefore, if there weren't a, a constant source of immigrants from some nearby source population, a sink population would go extinct. All right, that's the definition of a sink population. Now, what if, now we can imagine a source population that has another source population nearby, or a, let's say it has a, a small population nearby with a lower but positive growth rate. So imagine the source population has a lambda of 2.5, so it's really uh, strong growth. Now it has a nearby small population with a lambda of 1.1, so a population that's just barely growing. Now the source population will provide a net, will be a net donor of immigrants to that nearby satellite population with a 1.1 growth rate. That nearby population is not a sink population, all right, because it has a lambda above one. But it is called a pseudo sink population because uh, if in the absence of the source population, that sink population or the pseudo sink population would decline to a much lower abundance than it is currently. So a pseudo sink population has artificially augmented population size because of donor individuals coming from a nearby source population or one or more source populations. In isolation, a pseudosync would not go extinct. That's the difference between a pseudosync and a sink population. A sink population in the absence of immigration would go extinct. A pseudosync population would just decline to a lower abundance, all right? A pseudosync population maintains an equilibrium abundance above its carrying capacity due to the influx of immigrants from one or more nearby source populations. Let's move on to an insight maker model that hopefully will make these concepts clearer. Before we move on, let's introduce the scenario in this conceptual diagram here. What we have is one large source population. We have, we have a four population meta population here. One population represents a source population, a growing population that has the ability to donate individuals to nearby satellite populations. We have three sink populations at varying distances from the source population. Therefore, there's more dispersal from the source population to the nearby sink than to the mid-range sink than to the distant sink. So there's three sink populations. In addition, these sink populations have different carrying capacities. We're gonna imagine the, sink, the nearby sink population has a larger carrying capacity. The mid-range sink population has a intermediate carrying capacity and the distant sink population has a lower carrying capacity. And we can think of the carrying capacity as represented by the size of this circle. So the source population not only has the biggest carrying capacity, it has the highest potential for growth, and therefore it can donate individuals to these nearby sink populations. So we're gonna do this in Insight Maker. So where it says first click on this link and clone the source sink model, let's do that. I'm going to open it into a new tab and clone it and just take a look at the model once you've cloned it so just make sure you can understand it now don't feel like you have to understand it completely I just want you to understand conceptually what's going on you'll see in some of these um, <laughs> there's actually quite a bit going on in some of these flows uh, click here too Quite a bit going on in some of these flows but what's really going on is you have the growth of each population defined by a growth rate that is for the source population it's defined by this uh, parameter lambda good so lambda good represents 
the growth rate of the source population. And what we set it at right now is 2.1. So it has a good healthy growth rate well above one. Um, the, sink, the growth rate of the sink populations is defined by what's called lambda bad. And lambda bad is below one. Therefore, these are true sink populations. In the absence of dispersal, they should go extinct uh, over some time because they are declining. Um, the dispersal rates are defined in relation to a maximum dispersal rate. So the maximum dispersal rate is from the source population to the nearby sink. And the dispersal rate from the source population to the mid-range sink is some uh, percentage of the maximum dispersal rate, so like 25%. And the dispersal from the source population to the distant sink is even lower. All right. So we have like 1% dispersal. If you look at the dispersal from each neighboring source population or sink population, they're all dispersing at the rate of the, the maximum dispersal rate. If, they're, if you're neighboring, like this nearby sink neighbors the mid-range sink, dispersal occurs at the maximum rate. All right, so there's dispersal happening both from the source to the sinks, but also among the sink populations themselves, and it's defined by their geography. All right, so closer populations have a higher dispersal rate. Dispersal is basically just a fractional uh, component of each population disperses. So when we set the dispersal rate at 10%, that means 10% of these near this nearby sink will disperse to the mid-range sink and vice versa. 10% of the source population will disperse to the nearby sink and so on and so forth. So uh, the other parameters we have to be aware of is the um, initial abundance. So these are the initial abundances for the source population. Nearby sink is initialized at 10. In fact, all the sinks are initialized at 10, but the carrying capacities do vary. So that we set the carrying capacity of the source population to be 100. The carrying capacity of the nearby sink, it's a larger population, is 50. Um, the mid-range sink is 25 carrying capacity, and the distant sink is 15. So that's the scenario, all right? That's what's, uh, that's what's going on here. Don't feel like you have to understand the equations in the equation editors for the flows because they are a little bit complex, but conceptually that's what's going on. If we simulate, we see that clearly the source population is the largest with the highest carrying capacity. It's going to have the most individuals in it. And then the nearby sink has more don donors, individuals, more immigrants coming from the source population because it's closer. Plus it has a higher carrying capacity, so it's going to have a higher abundance. And this distance sink has a pretty low abundance because it has only a couple ways of getting individuals to it and they are uh, not very effective ways. There's only 1% of the source population that's migrating directly to the distant sink. And then you have individuals coming from the mid-range sink, which isn't as big and there's not as many donor uh, individuals available from the mid-range sink. So the distant sink is kind of in tough shape. It's not only not good habitat, it's not only small, but it doesn't have very many dispersers, so it doesn't end up with a very high abundance. In fact, sometimes it goes extinct and gets recolonized by the neighboring sink population or the source population. So this is the scenario and this is what it looks like. Hopefully it makes sense that um, this is the result we get. Let's, uh, it's always a good idea when running models like this is to try to break them. What I mean by that is run a scenario that's simple and that has an obvious right answer and then see if it gives you that answer. So what if we cut the dispersal rate to zero? Let's just cut the dispersal rate. If we cut the maximum dispersal rate to zero, then all dispersal is stopped. There is no dispersal. What should happen here? Well. The source population is, you know, has a lambda above one, so it should be okay. Um, but the sink populations have lambda well below one, it's 0.8. So they should decline and there's no other influx of individuals 
So it, it should decline to extinction. All the sink populations should decline to extinction. Let's see if we can break this model, if, if the model uh, performs as we expect for this simple case. And it does. So quickly, all the, so the sink populations become extinct if there's no dispersal from the source population. So that at least gives us some uh, confidence in this model. The model's doing what we expect it should do. All right, let's um, make the dispersal rate 1%, 0.01 for the dispersal rate. Let's run it. And we see there is, the, the sink populations are populated, but just barely. And if we look at the distant sink, this, this figure here uh, indicates the, the carrying capacity of the distant sink is 15 and the population is just not there. There's not enough immigrants to even make this effectively a sink population at all. A sink population is really only a sink population if it's a population. If it's mostly extinct, it's, it's hardly considered a sink population. So what I would like you to do is to try to find a level of dispersal that keeps the distant sink populated throughout the simulation, right? And the simulation here, we're running for 200 years, all right? So I want uh, you to find a scenario. Let's, let's, go, let's make it go up to like 0.1 again. And we will run the sensitivity testing tool, but we're gonna use the distant sink. We're gonna monitor the distant sink abundance, all right? And let's run it for, let's say we run it for 100 uh, times, and let's just see what happens. I want somewhat guaranteed that the sink, that the distant sink will have individuals in it all, all years. And here we see this 95% region, even the 80% region includes zero. So um, even the even the 50% region. So even, you know, 25% uh, or more um, of the time, this uh, sink population will go down below zero, at least uh, for a few years during this 200 year setup. So that's not a good answer. I want you to find the level of dispersal that, keep, that we can basically guarantee that the distant sink will always have at least some individuals in it every year, all right? So take a little time to play around with that and then answer the question on Top Hat. When you're done with that question, what I'd like you to do is first change the dispersal rate back to 10%. Now what we're gonna do is reduce the population growth rate in the source population. That's the lambda good parameter. Um, what happens now? So let's go back to our clone of the source sink model. Um, first of all, we're gonna move dispersal rate. So make sure it's uh, 10% and that all the parameters are back to their original values. So it should look the way it did when we started like this. All right, now what we're going to do is take lambda good, that is the, the growth rate of the source population and reduce it to 1.1. So now it's just barely growing. It doesn't have nearly as much uh, potential for growth, nor potential for donating individuals to other sink populations than it used to. All right, so it's not as good as it once was. We've reduced the quality of the source population. What happens in this case? We did, that's all we changed. Look at that. So what's going on here? Well, the source population is still donating individuals to nearby populations, and those sink populations have a declining growth rate. And the source population is not able to sustain that donation of individuals. It effectively has a net 
outflow of individuals because yes, it has a growth rate above one, but then a lot of those individuals leave and try to populate nearby sink populations. And effectively, the source population has now uh, is now on the losing end. The outflows outweigh the inflows when you consider the whole BIDE equation, B-I-D-E, births, immigration, deaths, immigration. When you consider the whole, all those processes, there's a net outflow from the source population, and therefore this is not sustainable anymore. The whole system is not sustainable. In fact, what we get is global extirpation of this meta population in this case. All right. Now, what happens if lambda good is 1.0? Well, of course, that's going to go extinct too. And is it ever possible that a population with a lambda of one could be an effective source population? And if you think about it, the answer should be no, because this population is just enough to sustain itself. Even at its best case scenario, the births equals the death. So it doesn't have any room for emigration. It can't give any individuals to another nearby population because in the Bide equation, the births already balance the deaths and there's nothing else to give. The population will be a declining population if it's giving any individuals or donating any individuals to nearby populations. All right. So just to verify though. Yep, it goes extinct in this case. So let's move that back to 2.1, which is where we had it before, and just verify that we're back to the scenario that we had when we started. And the next thing I want you to do is to make the sinks be pseudo sinks. So to do that, let's make lambda bad equal to 1.1 now. So it's just barely growing. These, these sink populations now should sustain themselves even in the absence of dispersal. Let's, let's uh, just make sure that that's true. So we'll move dispersal rate to zero and just make sure that we still see, oh, a couple of them did go extinct by random chance through demographic stochasticity. Uh, because they're small, and demographic stochasticity does do that to small populations. This time, only one population went extinct. But as you can see, um, they can sustain themselves. <laughs> that distant sink is not uh, going to sustain itself because demographic, it's so small that demographic stochasticity will probably um, you know, do away with it um, unless there's dispersal from outside. So in the absence of dispersal, that distant sink is kind of uh, in bad shape, even if it has a positive lambda. But um, let's illustrate the concept of the pseudo sink. To do that, we should let's jack up this maximum dispersal rate to its the maximum value anyway that is on the slider bar. So 25% uh, maximum dispersal rate. Lambda good is still at 2.1. Lambda bad is 1.1 so it's above one it's it's not a sink by definition it's these are not sink populations these three um, let's look at it first of all we see that all all the populations are able to sustain fairly large populations because not only can the sinks grow in the absence of immigration but there's a lot of immigration as well and so uh, they can sustain themselves. Even the distant sink is able to sustain itself over time. All right. If we look at this figure here, we see the abundance of the distant sink, and then we see the, the carrying capacity for the distant sink. And you should notice that the abundance of the distant sink is generally well above, oftentimes twice or three times above what um, it would be above its own carrying capacity, above where it would settle in the absence of dispersal. So here is the um, abundance of the distant sink over time relative to its own carrying capacity. And then if we reduce dispersal down to a very low rate, let's look at it again and see what happens. Here it um, hovers around its own carrying capacity. It's not getting many donors. Um, so the definition of a pseudo sink is a, is a 
population that's artificially inflated by Im immigration from outside the population. And if you were to remove that source uh, of immigrants, the population would decline back to its carrying capacity. So that illustrates what a, um, what a pseudo sink is. At its maximum dispersal rate, the abundance should be well above carrying capacity in that distant sink, that distant pseudo sink, I should say. And when dispersal rate is lower, it hovers below or at its own carrying capacity. So that is the concept of a pseudo sink. We're going to go through one more demonstration, but first take a minute to answer the top hat question on pseudo sinks. All right, the last thing I want to do in this lecture is just do a demo in Insight Maker using the same setup here that illustrates the concept of an ecological trap. All right, so what is an ecological trap? Let's imagine this nearby sink is our ecological trap. Now, an ecological trap is going to be super attractive to individuals. So this species is going to be super attracted to this nearby sink. It has really good looking habitat. The habitat seems to be great and individuals are going to disperse to that site because it looks really good. Now, in reality, it's called a trap. So you can imagine what's going on. In reality, this is not good habitat for whatever reason. Maybe there's lots of predators there and uh, the species cannot detect that they're there. Uh, maybe there's some anthropogenic feature about that that looks attractive but is not actually good habitat. One example uh, from the turtle world that I'm very familiar with is in nesting areas. Now some turtles like Blanding's turtles uh, like to nest in soft soil. Now in uh, May or June when these turtles are coming up to nest um, they they look for soft soil now um, agricultural fields can be perfect they they uh, it's soft it's easy to dig it's somewhat moist and they and it's open um, and that just perfect nesting habitat for Blanding's turtles so they end up putting their eggs in agricultural fields and then what happens well how would they know it but uh, some uh, big equipment comes through and tills up the eggs or uh, there's uh, you know a machine comes through and plants um, you know s corn seeds or whatever it is and uh, the area becomes totally shaded out by crops and then the harvester comes through and kills all the hatchlings so uh, for whatever reason, um, it's attractive habitat for an ecological trap is it is attractive habitat that ultimately is not effective habitat. Um, and this can happen in, in many cases. Oftentimes, um, human modifications of land uh, causes areas to be ecological traps uh, because the animals cannot really detect the signal that it's bad habitat. They didn't evolve with that. Um, sometimes this is called an evolutionary trap because that means that the animals are not evolved to detect the threat in this habitat. All right, so that's that's kind of the definition of an ecological trap. Let's let's actually make it. Uh, let's make this nearby sink an ecological trap. So to do that, what we have to do is we have to force individuals to migrate to this ecological trap. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to force 50% of the source population every year to migrate to the ecological trap. So this, what this says here is that pretty much everyone stays. If you're in the nearby sink, you're going to stay there because it looks great to you. And if you're in the source population, you're going to move with a 50% chance to the ecological trap or the nearby sink. And so I'm just going to like get rid of this. This is called a uh, block comment. Um, here we go. All right. 
So I'm just commenting out so the Insight Maker doesn't recognize any of this code from before. And now I'm going to force um, lots of individuals from the source population to move to our ecological trap. The other thing I have to do is to make the trap not, I have to make the lambda of the trap very low. So let's first go back to our original. So this, the lambda for the sink population should be 0.8. The dispersal rate we'll put at 0.1. Um, every, all the other parameters should be at the values that we originally had them at. But what we need to do here is to force the lambda in the ecological trap to be really bad. In fact, we're gonna make it so bad that it's basically uh, only 25% survival in the nearby sink. So what we're gonna do is, let's comment, we'll block comment out this original code here. And now we're gonna force 25% or a lambda of 0.25, which is means basically only 25% of the previous year's population in the nearby sink survives. So it's pretty bad. Um, so this represents now an ecological trap. Not only really high dispersal to the ecological trap, but really high mortality within the ecological trap. So this has the, the ingredients for this habitat to be a trap. And again, all the other parameters are at the values we set them at originally. So we can try to run this scenario and see what happens. Oh, we got global extinction. Let's try it uh, a couple more times, see what happens. Oh, global extinction. One more time. Can we get it to persist? Yes, okay, so occasionally this Metapopulation will persist, but the presence of the ecological trap certainly is not beneficial to the metapopulation. So what could we do? If we were a manager of this system, would we, what would we do here? Would the system be better off if we just got rid of the ecological trap entirely so that animals were not attracted to it? The answer, of course, is yes. The, the meta population would be actually better off if we just destroyed the ecological trap. The ecological trap is is causing major issues for this meta population, and if we uh, got rid of it, it would actually improve things. So that raises an interesting question: Is what is the value of sink populations now? One question is, are all sink populations essentially ecological traps? I mean, they're attracting some individuals from a source population, right? And all in all, there's more mortality in these sink populations, if it's a real sink population, than, than births. And so individuals from the source population where habitat is good are being shunted off into bad habitats. So are all sink populations ecological traps? What do you think? It's an interesting discussion. I might post, uh, pose that as a discussion because I'd like to see your thoughts on it. Uh, and I'll just conclude this lecture with the question, could it ever be desirable to remove a sink population to improve the conservation status of a meta population when if so, when would it be desirable to do that? How does that relate to the concept of density dependence? And let's just go through a scenario that, that might help make sense of that question. So sink populations in this case may not be really a bad thing for conservation. Here we have a large source population that's able to maintain a set of three satellite populations, each of which would not persist in the absence of dispersal from the source population, meaning it's a, they're true sinks, those satellite populations. Occasionally, for example, once per 100 years, a catastrophic fire eradicates the source population. However, the source population is then colonized by individuals migrating from 
the satellite or sink populations. In the absence of the sink populations, the entire meta population would almost certainly go extinct. All right. So does it make sense that sink populations can have benefits? It may not make sense to eradicate or destroy all sink populations just because the habitat's not that great. It still supports some individuals, right? And how does this relate to the concept of density dependence? Well, with density dependent models, some individuals are expendable in a population. Once the population is above half of carrying capacity, some individuals are expendable. We know that because we can harvest them sustainably, right? We've been through that. We can harvest individuals from these populations sustainably. Um, that means that in this density dependent models, some individuals are expendable. If they move to a sink population, it's better than them just dying, right? That means they're still alive. Aren't there more individuals in the meta population if the sink populations are there than if the sink populations weren't there? So that's one thing. It just allows some individuals to persist when otherwise they wouldn't persist. It, it increases the total abundance of the meta population. We know higher abundance means lower risk of extinction from demographic stochasticity. And in addition, it can allow for spreading the risk even in the face of environmental stochasticity, such as the fire scenario, because the fire may not affect the sink populations. The sink populations may be the ultimate source of donors so that source populations can become recolonized. So for many reasons, sink populations can be desirable to have in a meta population. We don't necessarily want to destroy them. We might think about getting rid of an ecological trap. If we can identify an ecological trap in the landscape, that might be a good, uh, we might have a good case to recommend to managers that they uh, get rid of that issue. But sink populations aren't necessarily an issue. So that's an interesting um, thing to think about. And that is where I will end this lecture.